In this episode of Kestoshi, I talk about recent news events with Jeff Hancock of CoinPass. Jeff is a former security expert, so he really knows his stuff. We talk about the fallout from the Celsius, 3AC and Voyager bankruptcies and where the yield comes from with a lot of these black box crypto companies. We also discuss about what you need to learn in crypto to be a good trader, from understanding crypto transactions to understanding MetaMask. We also talk about the Ethereum merge and the five stages, the merge, the surge, the verge, the purge and the splurge. Um, yes, that, that's correct. That is actually what they're called. We also talk about fire blocks and the role of stable coins and whether there is a need for a GBP stable coin. Enjoy the episode. <laughs> Welcome to Kastoshi, and today we have Jeff Hancock with us, and we're going to discuss a few of the um, current events in crypto. So welcome, Jeff. Could you just uh, give us uh, two minutes about your background? Oh, for sure. Um, thank you very much for inviting me on. Uh, it's obviously great to talk with new, um, talk with new networks, communities of people. Um, you know, we're all about crypto. We want to learn something new, and there's always um, you know, some really, really interesting characters I found in the space and hopefully I can, uh, I can be one of those for you. Um, my background in crypto is, you know, not as long as some others. I got involved um, in kind of the tech side of it back in, I suppose, 2014. Uh, financial services client came to us back when I was an engineer. My, my previous background was a cybersecurity engineer. Financial services firm in London. They were hacked, uh, ransomware, et cetera, et cetera. That was my first exposure to Bitcoin, but I didn't really take it seriously until about 2017. Um, I used to consult for SoftBank at the Vision Fund. Um, I set up a lot of their technical systems when they first launched and I was doing a bit of property, a bit of consulting, doing a lot of crypto stuff online. Um, at the top of the ICO peak, I must have had something like 250 tokens, too many to count. <laughs> I got out of a few of them with with, with with a bit of profit, but not not anywhere near the top. I don't think anyone ever called that top, really. Um, launched CoinPass in 2018 as a UK-based fiat on and off ramp. Um, there were not a lot of GBP options in 2018. Uh, a lot of the banking was over in Lithuania or Latvia, so we wanted to do a, a really hardcore UK offering. Um, and yeah, we're still chugging along in, in in 2022 and about to launch some uh, some other staking, some other cool stuff. So it's been quite an adventure. Uh, it's always been good fun. Um, but, uh, you know, the market's gone through like, what, four or five different cycles since then. And uh, I don't think any one person has got it right. So, you know, I'm all for learning and content and, and doing podcasts and talking to people like yourself. So thank you for having me on. Okay, great. Okay, so what should we talk about first? Oh, I mean, it's kind of what's in the news, right? The biggest ones around are the, you know, still Celsius, still Voyager, still three areas capital. I don't think we're going to see the end of that fallout kind of anytime soon. And I think, you know, it's only doing more damage to crypto's image. You know, everyone wants to see what's the latest headline and, you know, what's the latest effect of it. Where always further and further and further away of what it can be and what crypto and what blockchain i suppose can can do and that's probably my biggest qualm at the moment is still we're dealing with image problems in 2022 yeah i mean that's a good point because i think most people are just looking at price so a lot of you know i mean you probably get the same people like tapping me on the shoulder all the time saying have you hit the bottom have you hit the bottom and, and i just say to them you're asking the wrong question yeah <laughs> And uh, I get a lot of people actually coming to me and saying, um, like, have you hit the bottom? And I say, do you actually understand how this thing works? And people don't understand that that basically people have lent money to other people, to other people, to other people. It's basically yeah. like a domino effect. And people say, well, what do I need to do to make money? And I say, learn solidity. And they say, oh, I don't want to know. <laughs> yeah. As to me, it's so, like the the technical aspect of it, you know, it can be as simple as traditional investing, if not faster. Mm. Um, a, a cool comment I heard a couple of weeks ago, and I'll have to find the link or the article and forward it back to you when this gets posted. But they were talking about the, the relation of volatility in, in crypto markets compared to you know regular traditional markets, traditional mm. investing. They kind of can mirror each other just at far different timeframes. Mm. I mean, yeah, we see 50% drops in crypto all of the time. You know, yeah. but we've seen 50% property drops before. We've seen 50% FX drops before. It's just what the technology can do for an asset because it is global and because it is real time. 
it's basically a representation of other markets just a lot faster you know you can't take a stock and a share from your hargreed lands down account and move it over to uh the philippines and liquidate it you know you can't you sorry, you can sell a property in the mm. uk to a foreign investor but you're dealing with a, a market of three people that have the time the effort the money the the legal team the accounting team the banking support to buy a property in another country so those are possible but not near the speed that i can send a bitcoin from here to another exchange and liquidate it like that you know instant arbitrage mm -hmm. so really when everyone says crypto market's too volatile and where's the bottom where's is this you could almost ask the same thing like when's the next property bubble gonna mm -hmm. burst when's the next fx drop gonna burst when's the next x y and z gonna kick off that's where i think people need to widen their gaze a little bit and maybe look inwards a little bit on their relationship with money mm. how can i make money how when's the next next best nft to buy da, 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 da. there's mm. just that yeah inflation sucks everyone's getting pinched left right mm. and center um but you can't look at crypto or bitcoin or however you want to separate two as a uh, as a get rich scheme. it's almost like a, a not get poor slower scheme yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people are treating it as a casino, actually. And I think this is a problem is, as you said, the relationship to money is like, you know, there's people saying, oh, if Bitcoin goes to 10K, I'll buy it. And then it's like, it's like I say, yeah, but you still have to understand how Bitcoin works. And people say, well, why do I need to know how it works? All I need to know is it, it has to go up. And I say, you don't need to know. I said, the reason you need to know how it works is you need to know when you have to sell. I said, if you don't understand how it works you're never going to um know whether whether it's the right time to sell because like maybe something you know really does supersede it for example yeah you no know? no exactly um, and I, th I think going to one of the comments you said earlier we're in for a lot more bad news um, i mean i think as i said earlier i think we have a lot of cascading defaults happening and there's a lot of stuff mm. hidden what's your view on this yeah the the black box effect basically um i think it's 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 kind of a mixture of acronyms there's there's more than enough acronyms in this space than even in tech and i worked in tech for 15 years far too long um the mixture that everything's the same everything's blockchain everything's crypto it's it's, it's just not there's just that there's a lot of traditional money management there's a lot of traditional uh you know investors or hedge funds or or rogue traders um doing the deeds behind the scenes you know this whole relation of um are my with uh, celsius and and blockfi and, and all of those kind of um centralized loan and lending companies you see in the marketing copy and on the screen eight percent apy eight percent's great it's not bleeding inflation at the moment but eight percent would usually be in traditional terms a, a very good return um getting eight percent on your litecoin i've never made eight percent on any litecoin trade ever um but uh it kind of brought on a bit of a late, a lazy investor sort of, um, sort of mindset. Uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 I think the people that got hurt the most with this whole three arrows capital Celsius Voyager was the people that bought in north of 30 K. Mm -hmm. So middle of last year where we saw prices going up, there's, there's a bit of a rally, you know, it was mm -hmm. all, all charm and cool. We're out of COVID. I can go back out now. I could talk crypto with people, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of people buying in, they saw an incredibly good, you know, rise and rally and everyone's mm. happy during a rally. And then as soon as it turns around and goes south, it's like, well, okay, I was told by people it should be a five-year, 10-year play. Mm. I was told Bitcoin's the hardest form of money, blah, 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 mm. blah. Now that it's gone down, I don't want to lose. So I'll give it to someone to get an 8% return. Mm. Now, when we're say about, you know, different acronyms and et cetera, mm. these is, centralized... is that what people were doing? Is that what people were doing? Yeah, As it was cool, going cool. down, then they were lending out to try and get something instead of nothing i detect that that's one of my surmises yeah i mean okay. we talk with a lot of people uh both on the on the institutional front and high net worth front you know a lot of asset managers in london asking mm -hmm. about ethereum we had you know we were talking to someone in 2019 what was mm -hmm. bitcoin like 5k 5000 mm -hmm. pounds i think it was mm -hmm. and they were you know our clients were asking about it we were thinking mm -hmm. about it that i said just buy one bitcoin just one mm -hmm. You know, buy half a Bitcoin, whatever. Yeah, the account is mm. nothing. Buy one, sit on it, just so you understand it. Mm. You know, take custody of it so you understand it, mm. like we were talking about. Um, they come back to me in 2021 wanting to buy three and a half million worth of NFTs. So we went from mm. buying one Bitcoin at 5K <laughs> to buying something even more speculative and even mm. less, even more liquid. 
Um, so yeah, some of the acronyms and the speed of the market is definitely troubling sometimes. But I think where I was seeing a lot of market sentiment and a lot of marketing spend, you know, based mm -hmm. on ads, based on the other analytics mm -hmm. that we follow as part of our marketing strategy, is a huge interest in lending and staking and APY and getting mm -hmm. a return on yield on assets was the big was the big thing mm -hmm. for 2021, 2022. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I think a lot of people were caught out. They were new to the space. They bought in. They'd seen a rally. Mm -hmm. Some of them sold, took the loss. Some of them sold, took less profit. The other ones that wanted to hashtag hodl wanted to place it somewhere where they get a yield, you know, mm -hmm. thinking it's something like an index fund that's managed mm -hmm by mm. Hargreaves, Lansdowne or Fidelity mm. or someone else. And what they kind of failed to either read or do the due diligence on or research was anytime crypto goes into these platforms, it's an unsecured loan. And by an unsecured loan, they can algo trade it. They can lend it. Mm. They can whatever you want to do with it. Mm. Um, because there's no there's no staking mechanism for Bitcoin. There's mm. no staking and, and AMM mechanism for Litecoin and XRP. Only on your USDC, USDTs and Ethereum when they're actually some sort of DeFi aspect, those are the only ones that might be able to get those kind of yields. But still, I mean, getting 8 to 12% kind of ludicrous without taking any sort of risk. And then when they eventually, you know, the market turns and, you know, margins get pinched and margin calls start to happen. Yeah. Um, some people said they were caught off guard and and now can't access their asset, assets. It's like, yeah, well, you're guaranteeing 8% return on a, on a falling asset. How are they going to make that money? Where does that yield come from? I think it's where a lot of the education for a lot of people, it just wasn't there. A lot of panicking. I remember yeah. previous to this, we had the we had the lunar crash. What like a month beforehand as well. So it kind of everyone got wiped out at the same time, and it was one of those blood in the streets moments yeah. that I don't think anyone was really mentally or emotionally prepared for. But but how much of this? Because I know how much of it I could see was happening from the inside. Mm. Um, uh, how much of this did you act? Could you actually see was like bound to happen? bound to happen i mean let's start with luna because that was kind of the the catalyst of what turned a major part of the market around i mean the market already come back from 60k 69k and we 67k and we we're already on our way down yeah. but the luna crash was either an amazing arb play by someone uh that definitely knows their stuff um that whole three and a half billion back uh, bitcoin backing that was kind yeah. of propping up um yeah. ust uh the fact you're getting 20 percent return by using the anchor protocol, like where does mm. that 20% come from? Actually, mm. it comes from a finite treasury that's been mm. hemorrhaging cash for a very long time. It was kind of preordained like months and months and months in advance, but I think mm. everyone was kind of just wanting to ignore it. Um, mm. If you go back, you can read stuff on on Reddit from like November last year of people warning about Terra mm. X, Y, and Z and actually mm. reading the right white paper, looking at the on-chain data, looking mm. where the capital is coming from. Mm. Some of the big moves between the Terra protocol and the uh, the lab, uh, the software labs behind it and all joke one and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there, I think there was a lot of kind of writing on the wall before it happened. But when that first set of, let's say, cascading liquidations happened, um, there was this big influx of information so fast that the, the price on chain and the activity on chain was completely mm. different and irrelevant from all the stuff that was on exchanges. So mm. it was just, it was an absolute free for all. Um, and I've seen that market panic before when the when the ICO mm. when the ICO crashes happen. Mm. So yeah, okay. I mean, for me, I had warned people about UST how it could implode, and, and I think it was a case of I realise now I was talking, and all people would see would be my lips moving and be thinking, just shut shut up, you know. Uh, what, what when when be... to buy? When to buy? When to buy? <laughs> yeah. yeah. What would be your advice to someone? Because I know what my own advice is. Whenever anyone asks me how do I make money in crypto, I say learn solidity first. If it's good enough for Mark Cuban, it's good enough for you. I say. Um, well, I don't know. He's he's gone through the press this week about the whole Voyager recommendations he was doing. So, but but, but, but he's under, he's understanding the basics. Yeah, he's trying understand to understand the basics. The basics. No, no, it's still so, it's still education first. Yeah. So what what would, what would your advice be to someone who, who wants to? Well, I'll, I'll tell you my advice first. My advice is. I say to someone, understand how it works, install MetaMask, do some transactions, um, understand yeah. how blockchains work, look at where the space is going with different chains, because the place to make money is by filling in the gaps for where Definitely. it's going to be in yeah, five yeah. years. I, and I completely agree with that. And I think it's just, it's a knowledge is power kind of thing, right? Um, paying for your education, you know, go and mess up a transaction, 
and still the MetaMask, you know, in, you know, pay a gas fee. People mm. say, oh, I don't want to pay five, $5 for a gas fee. That's cheap. It should have been here <laughs> last cheap. year. Jesus. <laughs> um, well, yeah. it's even less. It's about, about 75p at the moment. Yeah. But um, yeah, pay, that, that whole paying for education, if you can afford, you know, a couple of coffees out a month or one meal out a month, mm. have one less and mm. put that hundred pounds into Bitcoin or ETH or whatever the non-financial device, NFA kind of thing is. But, you know, actually go and do it making a deposit from your bank to an exchange and trading it. That's the same activity as going into any other form of finance, whether you're trading a bond, a stock FX, you know, your, your, your SIP, your ISA, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Those activities are pretty much the same. When you take it off exchange, you go into your own wallet, into your ledger, understanding what a block is, understanding how to, how to look at a transaction, I think is, is an amazing one. I mean, our support desk mm -hmm. obviously has you know, not just automated replies, but, um, uh, the stock replies on, you know, where's my transaction? Is like, ha have you looked at the transaction hash? Yeah, the, mem the, the mempool is full. There's nothing mm. I can do about the Bitcoin blockchain. Mm. Um, gas fees are stupid right now. So there's a queue. You know, understanding, like you said, those, those, those blocks in the middle, uh, how to find data or how to understand data on chain, I think is probably the most prolific thing that is missing with a lot of people's crypto education. Not be able to go to Explorer, you know, knowing the different Explorers, Bitcoin, Ethereum, XLM, Polkadot, etc. Going on to mm. those chains and looking at transactions. Mm. That's probably where the biggest part of my education came from mm. when I was getting started in kind of 2017, because these tools kind of weren't there. Mm. Or if they were there, they were in plain text and they were horrible. Mm. Um, mm. And now we've got better UI. Uh, they update a lot faster. They're using mm. modern tool sets. There's browser extensions. There's, there's mm. you name it. And the, um, the mobile experience is a lot better. I mm. didn't expect crypto to go as mobile as it has this quickly. Mm because mm. I found it's a very restrictive interface. Mm. But I think mobile is kind of nearly 50% of the market now for even mm. doing dApp stuff. Uh, versus when you say change. mobile, do, do you mean things like the Solana smartphone that's going to come out? Or are you talking about MetaMask uh, mostly, and mobile? Yeah, mostly MetaMask and mobile, other apps on mobile, you know, uh, DeFi wallets on mobile. They've mm. gotten a lot better. I mean, mm. personally, I still do everything on a on a specific browser or a specific mm. desktop or whatever for doing all my, my DeFi stuff or smart mm. contract stuff. But the interoperability for mobile is, has gone in leaps and bounds mm. in the last few years. You know, mm. uh, a token's launched, uh, which is brand new, or a DeFi app is launched mm. brand new, and it's supported on you know, pretty much all the major apps immediately mm. because mm. of the way it's built on Ethereum or, or on the supporting chain. But the, um, yeah, I think even stuff like MetaMask and those other ones have, have gotten supremely better for even the... Let's face it; it's not a beginner's tool, is it? Mm. Uh, for yeah. the in, even the intermediate user has gotten a lot better in the last kind of two years, which is uh, which is a good mm. thing. I, I think one of the issues with things like NFTs is you have to choose a, a chain. For example, Solana, you might yeah. use you know you might use Magic Eden to have it on Solana. Yeah. You might use OpenSea for Ethereum. You might use Mintable. You know, you know, there, yeah. there's so many, and I th I think until there's a proper cross-chain NFT solution. Mm. I still think that we're in this kind of we're at this point where there's not Tribal. going to be any huge breakout hits of NFTs. Yeah, uh, it's it's that kind of tribal chain versus chain, isn't it? Um, mm. You're you're in an ecosystem and you have to kind of grin and bear it. Um, and that's where I think we the whole you know, the big NFT craze and and bubble that happened. Depending on what you think of NFTs, yes or mm. no. I think the tech's cool, the understanding's cool. I just for JPEGs. So, mm. um, Actually, can I ask you, what, what, what do you think NFTs are then? Well, they're non-fungible tokens. And what is non-fungible token used for? And the used for bit, the used case, I'm very, very interested in. Don't get me wrong. Oh, okay, um, sure. Yeah. But when it when it comes to the current, you know, the current speculation use mm. case on a lot of NFTs, um, when my plumber comes to my flat. And tells me he's launching an NFT collection. That's not. That's not a good. I'm, I'm not. I wish I was kidding about that. I genuinely wish oh, I was. Oh, I thought you were kidding. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, okay. I wasn't. No, no, no. He's, he was, he was toxic zombie golfers or something. I don't know. Um, but when when you know, I don't know how to launch a collection. Hire an artist, mm. get someone to launch it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. But when someone's launching ten thousand NFTs, that does plumbing on the side. You know, you like mm. the taxi driver telling you when to buy mm. Bitcoin. Mm. Um. But I mean, I've seen some really, really good examples mm. of NFTs because they're effectively collectibles, a lot of artwork, et cetera. Mm. Um, platform up in, was it called Origin? Origin is something else. I can't remember. In um, Manchester-based. Mm. And they're using it as a distribution 
platform. So the artist has portfolio work. He's like, I'm going to do uh, 25 pieces of this. So he does the original mm. and the original has a singular NFT mm. and people could buy that. And that's the original, blah, blah, mm. blah. But he'll then also do a limited run. He'll actually paint the same thing 25 times. So it's like 25 mm. duplicates, but they are still mm. done by him. He'll sell the 25 upfront. Mm. That might be 500 each. There might be a thousand each. Depends on the canvas, mm. blah, 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 blah. And then everyone gets their NFT. But then within three months, mm. they'll get their physical bit of artwork. Oh, that's but nice. That's really yeah, cool. yeah. So you cool. get, you're getting you're getting something real life. It's an NFT mm. that means something. It's mm. it's a one to one with the physical mm. delivery. Mm. But he's basically paying for his living. Mm. You know, he he paints for a living. It's a mm. way to get a portfolio out there. It's a way to get expression. It's a way to get customers. Mm. And they use it for a distribution platform. It's not just a digital artwork that sits out there forever. Mm. It also matches. The other, and that's where I think there's a lot of value in those mm. because each NFT is paired to each one. It's got the same serial bar, or the same the same barcode, and the mm. same um, mm. the same thing on every single one. And I thought that was a really really cool concept. Mm. And the other one that I've already seen, which I missed the sale of because I didn't have the capital for it, was um, um, subscriptions and um, memberships. Yeah, club memberships. In yeah, yeah. yeah. The club in London, shout out to the, the crypto club at Blacks. Mm. Uh, Jason and all his team down there doing amazing stuff. Mm. Um, you buy a, you know, like what's a club membership in London per year? Three grand, five grand, something like that. Mm. But you have that in an NFT instead of having your name on a list, whoever mm. holds the NFT at the time of entry is permitted entry. So you, but so is that you, you hold your mobile phone up to a door or something and it lets you enter? Mobile phone, yeah. Mobile phone to the door, and obviously they can tell if it's a fake one or not because they can look at it on chain. Does this wallet hold this NFT? It's a very easy concept. Is this a real? Is this a real membership? I might. Does that work account. today? Does that work today? By yeah. the way, yeah. Oh, what's, it? Already, you, what's it called? It's called the crypt. It's called the Crypto Club. Uh, okay. Done by Blacks. So you look up Crypto Club Blacks London. Yeah. Uh, Jason, Rob, all the team down there. Uh, yeah. They have a Discord channel. Yeah. Um, I'm not affiliated with them whatsoever. I had the option to buy a founder's NFT. I didn't have the capital all the time. And that was for a lifetime membership. Mm. So as a lifetime membership for I can go to the first club or any other clubs I might have around the world. And I thought that the idea of of a membership tied to a mm. non-fungible token that mm. I can choose to sell mm. if I want to. Mm. Uh, I might go out of town for three to six months. Mm. I could loan that to someone else. I could do mm. a lot of different things with it. So the idea of having you know a ticket, a subscription, a membership, something like that mm. in an NFT format, I think is a very, very good use of technology. Mm. Look mm. at what happened in France with football. Mm. All those fake tickets that went out there. And there was like what twenty percent of the crap twenty percent of the crowd started a riot because yeah. they couldn't get in they had fake yeah. tickets. What's going to happen at the Olympics when Paris hosts it? You're going to have yeah. the same stuff happening. Yeah. You can't. I, I would never buy a ticket from a scalper outside of a, a yeah. football ground because you don't know if it's genuine or not. How yeah. do I know what a genuine ticket of a football match looks like? They're really, yeah. really good copies, yeah. but a digital, footprinted, signatured NFT back to a, an audited smart contract, that is a really, really good use of tech. You know, mm, and mm. I think for that kind of concept, NFTs are brilliant. Yeah, I mean, it's still early days because I, I heard they tried to do it at NFT New York and they had some problems at one point. But once it got working, you could get queues moving at a fast speed. Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's automation taking everything else. Mm. It's why we use uh, it was from cash to debit cards. Mm. And now it's from debit cards to mobile phones and watches and stuff mm. like that. It's just another extension of that. But now I can have... Yeah, the NFTs of ownership of all my mm. goods, you know, my mm. car, my this, this, mm. this. I can represent ownership of all my stuff, and no one can take it from me. Um, mm. And I think no, it's a really, really good, good use of the tech. But mm. we're still at that, you know, ragged edge testing and implementation phase, rather than adoption, which is cool. Sure. I mean, this is where we, it's where we live. Okay. Um, now I know, I know we're on the clock here a bit, so let's. Could we talk a little bit about the Ethereum merge? Uh, oh, definitely. Yeah. That? Uh, really cool. I did like, I was actually had this image up just before, um, I was talking to my content creator about it. We've got the, what are the, um, what are the five, the five, um, five stages? We've got the, uh, I don't want to get it wrong because I think they're absolutely brilliant. Uh, are you talking there. about the move to the test net, the testing, the. No, 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 no. The, uh, the, the bigger picture, the bigger roadmap. Oh, so okay, sure, the, sure, yeah. Yeah, so obviously the, the thing we're talking about now is which the only thing that's changing, which is the big misconception, that, mm. that Ethereum is not moving to another chain. 
mm. you know big it's it's not changing it's the same chain it's just the consensus that's changing mm. uh the beacon chain is getting merged in front of it and miners will go away uh energy consumption crashes and there'll be graphics cards for everybody which is great if you're a gamer or, or they'll move to bitcoin there's gonna be graphics yeah yeah <laughs> so it'll be there'll be graphics cards for everybody um so that's cool but no what i really like was obviously we're going through the merge which is the change of the consensus algorithm mm. but then we've got the surge the verge the purge and the splurge and i went that's just amazing. are you kidding <laughs> that's great i love it i love Could it could you it was explain on, each um, one of those quickly in, in i can terms... read the notes really yeah. quick yeah yeah so oh. the merge is obviously our transition to proof of stake so mm -hmm. changing that mechanism will mm -hmm. top uh the surge is massive scalability increases for rolls up roll ups through sharding obviously we can mm -hmm. talk about sharding for mm -hmm. Years. make it faster make it faster make, well yeah segregating the network so if our two wallets are in the same shard it's like near instantaneous transaction but mm. if you're a uh you, you're talking to a foreign wallet or the app on a different other side of the world it might be in a different shard and it's just a, an easy way to categorize everything so uh, could i just give a bit of context on the first one so the first one moving to proof of state basically means yep. they're more environment they say that you know it doesn't have to have millions of yep. computers doing stuff so they say yeah. it uses well, like zero point one percent of the energy, or something. Yeah, ninety nine, ninety nine point nine nine yeah. reduction. Because you're going from big bulky miners with like eight nine graphics cards in it, sitting in a big hot mm. hot office, mm. versus what could be a virtual machine or a Raspberry Pi or something like that, and locking up your tokens with the software on the on the actual node doing the consensus. That's what secures the chain. Um, then you got the Verge. Uh, stake lists through Verkle trees and related features. I have no idea what a Verkle tree is. I'm going to yeah. do some Googling in my off time. We've got the purge, elim eliminating historical data and technical debt. And obviously this is doing a big cleanup of all the mm. old algos that we don't need. Mm. Um, all the stuff that was related to proof of work that's no longer needed. So mm. Chopping out all the, all the mm. fat. And then the splurge, miscellaneous but important extras with an exclamation mark. So that mm. one's definitely the the too hard for now sorted out in five years kind of kind of mm. thing but um it's it, it's a brilliant concept hey i'll let the marketing behind it i'm very mm. on marketing models at the moment so yeah just the, the merge the splurge no sorry the merge <laughs> the surge the verge the purge the splurge amazing so that's gonna be my wallpaper in the next few months i think so really really amazing things happening um definitely uh taking it to the level twos the level two chains that have kind of been ethereum's problem solver for a while now so do you mean um, things like polygon I like like, do you think yeah, this is yeah. going to decrease usage of any of the layer twos? Um, no, because I think there's still inherently, you know, they've still got their own their own USPs and everything's going for them. Mm. They've got their own NFT markets. They've got their own DEXs. They've got their own um, staking and DeFi, etc. I think, yeah, you know, this is just my personal speculation, but not knowing hardcore tech and hardcore development, I think we get to, you know, multiple proof of stake kind of chains with good yeah. interoperability in terms of the software layer, yeah. then I think it can only be a good thing that you can use a layer one, um, a layer one Ethereum. Uh, it won't even be considered a layer two anymore. It'll just be a side chain or a compatible product or a compatible whatever. I think yeah. the, the way we think about these layer two now will change, which I think is a good thing because yeah. when the new investor comes in, and looks at coin market cap and sees twenty thousand different ones out there. Mm. It's very, you know, it's that's not that's not the full picture. Mm. Having an asset that's supported across multiple chains mm. is obviously a really good thing for the entire ecosystem. And I think that's where, I think that's kind of the five year the five year goal for a lot of them is to have exposure or interoperability mm. with any of them. So when an asset is moved between chains, it burns mm. it on one, it creates on the other without having any of these third party bridges with points of exposure. Yeah, I mean, most of those have been hacked. And I, I know this is the goal of things like Cosmos so that people can try and find ways to bridge coins uh, um, in a secure fashion. Yeah, um, it's definitely in that secure fashion. So I think people want to do it and see the need for it. Mm. There's definitely a need for it. And choice comes down to choice, right? Mm. But yeah, the security of these bridges and stuff is, you know, it's been kind of talked to death on on how how weak yeah. they are, and hackers now that target them are not even doing it for financial gain. Some of them mm. are, are trying to to get through to these developers of these bridges, mm. which are clearly underfunded, mm. um, and don't respond to a a bug report or a bounty report. So of course they're going to go and take the money. Well, okay, can, can I ask you a, a question about the future? Like, um, in five years' time, do you see that companies like Microsoft and Google, um 
okay I'll, I'll tell you what i see as how i think it's going to happen you tell me if, if i'm talking any sense at all i think in five years time it's it, there's a possible future where everyone who has a gmail account which is like everyone will basically have their metamask or web wallet built in and oh, i yeah. think and i think that Google and Microsoft will probably have their own stuff running on their own chains. And they'll be semi, they won't be properly uh, DeFi or, or decentralized. And I think they'll try and get everyone, incentivize them to work on the Microsoft chain or the Google chain. Yeah, I mean, it's what we see right now with, it's it's Google GCP versus Azure versus AWS. Mm. You know, the majority of blockchain projects are sitting in Amazon with 5, 10K, 100K worth of credits. You know, so there's a huge centralization on the computing power on where these, you know, virtual machines actually live and where these nodes actually live. Um, but the, yeah, you're right. I think there's definitely going to be a clusterization or a centralization of some of those um, blockchain identity, uh, interoperability with other sites and stuff that just works. You know, we've mm-hmm. already seen that before. You like log in to a website you've never used before using your Google account. Great. I push a button. It logs me in. I can revoke my access at any time. That's a really good example of a web two solution that could have a web three kind of upgrade path. Um, But with that, having my, you know, I read a a counter argument against MetaMask as well. It is a massive single point of failure of having my assets, my bank transactions, payments, ID, and all of my history on one singular login with no dispersion whatsoever. So, I think it's kind of a bit of a mixed bag. I see it happening yeah. as a it works out of the box kind of thing because mm-hmm. let's face it, the Google stuff and Microsoft stuff usually works out of the box. Mm-hmm. But I think it's a really good little, almost like a bit of a gateway drug to get people into that sort of mindset of deny everything and everything's mine and I can choose who I want to allow access to. I think that's a good technological mindset to upgrade everybody and it gives them access to this whole world of DeFi and this whole world of nfts and this whole world of crypto it's the same thing with like you know the whole cashless society C- mm. cdbd C- cbdc's thing mm. will they kill bitcoin no they'll enhance bitcoin because you're mm. going to have you know instead of having gbp and us dollars floating in free air mm. they're going to be somewhat trans somewhat transparent on some sort of chain mm. with all the banks on one central ledger which they Mm. probably don't want. You know, I think Mm. that's only good for Bitcoin Mm. because you're bringing all the technical layers Mm. together now. And I Mm. think that's a good thing. So yeah, Mm. I think it's definitely positive. How it happens, stay current and keep making podcasts. But um, (laughs) yeah, no, it'd be a a really, really good thing. It'd be a really good thing. They they will do it. And if they're they're already working on it, they they have to be. I think one of the big problems is just say everything goes on chain and just say like, if I take... Most like most people are, are totally non-technical. You know, like we are the outliers here. Actually, even most people in tech are not technical, as you know. Um, and um, so, imagine if some everything goes on chain, and someone's living in their house, and their house is represented as an NFT, and then suddenly someone steals their wallet. What do they yeah. do? I think it comes down to the security of that wallet and how you restore access. And I think that restore access bit is something that hasn't been solved yet. I think you need to be able to secure a wallet, create a wallet, restore a wallet, and take back ownership of assets with some form of base biometric, something that's on you, something that's part of you. Mm. Um, We've shown that passwords are still weak. People use the same passwords over and over. Mm. We've shown that email is exceptionally weak Mm. because email security and Mm. da-da-da-da. You know, even 2FA. You know, people mm. lose 2FA codes all the time. So the the way of securing that wallet and restoring access to the to the rightful owner is still a trick we haven't really figured out. And I think that's probably the one of those big things that maybe Google and Microsoft will sort out. Mm. Because if you're going to do it that way, and you are going to be technically mm. self-sovereign of every asset we own, mm. not everyone's ready to be their own bank. Well, he, well here's a not suggestion that... Ready. Sorry, go on. No, no, that's it, yeah. No. Well, here's something I've been saying to people and people think I'm like evil for saying it is I can actually foresee like, you know, like we have mobile phone shops everywhere on the high street these days. I can foresee having government ID shops or ID brokers and having like on every high street and and every time someone wants to do something, maybe they'll just confirm a transaction and it's the place they'll go when they lose their ID, which I think will be happening all the time. 
post office already for that. I didn't know you can get your DVLA uh, UK license reissued by the post office. Um, because I rang up the DVLA and I said, oh, my mm. license is about to expire. I got an email mm. from, any, actually an email from an exchange mm. um, that says your license is about to expire. I'm like, is it? Mm. I didn't know that. No one else emailed. <laughs> DVLA didn't tell me. Mm. Um, and yeah, I had like 15 days left till my license expired. Mm. Um, being an Australian in the UK, it's a pain in the ass. So mm. I like, oh, well, I better sort this out. Mm. And they go, yeah, don't we don't have offices anymore. You can send it to us online or you just go to the post office and they'll do it for you. And I'm like, okay. So I walked down the post office and I said, oh, I need another license. They go, cool, took a photo. Mm. And they asked me if I they asked me if I live at the same address. And I'm like, well, I'm going to move in two months' time. Oh, just give me a new address. I'll just put that in there for me. They were happy to put a brand new address on my driver's license with no verification. I was like, wow. <laughs> wow. So you can totally mess up with that. Like, and yeah, I think I think you're onto something there. Is I think there will be those kind of sovereign government issued government audited mm. blah, blah 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 that will be some sort of account recovery or confirmation mm. or blah 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 because government services are, are expensive and they'll they'll push it into some sort of private sector or some sort of audited sector that could take care of it for them and this might be this might be extension it might be the post office it might be the you know the digital post office it might be who knows but mm. it needs to be accessible and easy for everyone it has to be a level playing field and that's the that's the tricky bit I, th I think this is an interesting thing, though, because a lot of people, when they talk about DeFi, a lot of people think of this purism, everything's decentralized. But as we saw with the whole DeFi of the last couple of years, I mean, from what I've seen, it's 99% centralized. A uh, very good portion of it. Yeah. We, if you want to talk about the code and where it runs, okay, mm. what chain is it running on and where are all the nodes on that chain? Mm. Um, who's a development team? This is a very, very mm. small development team. Yeah, this is mm. centralized counterparty of of technical knowledge mm. you know and then uh your counterparties and this is the problem for institutions coming in is they have to know who they're trading with you know they mm. can't do the um th throw my uni swap and my usdc into a mm. pool on mm. on on um on a dex mm. uh, they, they they don't have the ability to do that so there'll be institutional offerings like um ave arc which is an institutional only uh ave pool where everyone's KYB. Um, is that live was, now at the moment? Uniswap. I think it is. I've seen. I've seen the content and details around it from uh, from Fireblocks. So I, 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 I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah, you can onboard and and do all the DeFi pool stuff. And I think those institutional pools will get exceptionally big, exceptionally quick, mm. because of the pay on a part of the counterparties that are in there. But the um, yeah, the DeFi everywhere bit. I think the idea of it being. 100% decentralized mm. is trying to mimic off the back of Bitcoin success mm. because the miners are everywhere. And yeah, there was a lot in China and there's a lot mm. here. The Bitcoin network's gotten much more decentralized the last kind of few years. But the fact that anyone can play to play, you know, pay to play, mm. mine to play, whatever you want to call it, um, I think they want to take that that brand moniker, that um, mm. Uh, that that acceptance level of everything's decentralized mm. and kind of play that into uh, attracting more users and attracting more liquidity. Mm. But you're right, there is a huge amount of centralization still in this space, but the space is still exceptionally small. Mm. Doesn't matter how many billions of, of volume we do every day. It doesn't matter how many you know uh, transactions per second a specific blockchain does. When the big guys start joining us, like when Visa starts putting their stuff on chain, which they will, eventually because mm. it's better for them and better for their counterparties mm. when the jp morgans and the morgan chases and the mm. barclays are settling their ledgers because there's, there's less overhead and mm. there's more accuracy um then it's not how does blockchain beat the big guys is when did the big guys come and join us you know okay I mean? fair enough yeah i understand yeah and that's where i think there's there's still a big centralization bit right now but i think there's a, a, a very large decentralized option out there mm. there'll be the institutional one it'll be the non-institutional one mm. there'll be the ky seed one and there'll be the non-ky seed one and they'll still be interoperable which mm. is the most important bit yeah i noticed that you mentioned five blocks here just for anyone listening who doesn't know what five blocks is they're basically uh how would you describe five blocks uh i'd call it a a a, a wallet infrastructure platform they're not a custodian mm. um because whoever's issuing their wallets on Fireblocks holds mm. two out of the three keys in order mm. to rebuild it. 
Um, it's not insurance unless you offer the insurance yourself, mm. but it is a very cool bit of tech. So mm. the way you can organize wallets, issue wallets, create wallets, mm. interact with DeFi, etc. Uh, they're doing they're doing some really cool stuff down there. So we're a, we're a, um, a five blocks customer. We do our our um, customer wallets and our part of our warm storage on on five blocks. Um, and yeah, that's what the institutions are using as kind of the mm. the go to at the moment for either. Mm. OTC settlements for doing wallet connect into mm. AMMs, into Arbe, mm. into et cetera. It allows a high amount of customization for um, policies and security, et cetera. So your junior analyst can only sign $5,000 worth of transactions mm. per hour mm. or requires authentication, da, 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 da. So no, it's a cool bit of kit. It would take you a lot of money to build that in-house. So it's a it's, it's really, really interesting offering. And Is it fair enough to say... Out. They've kind of become like the Bloomberg of the crypto industry in a way. I think they? so. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we have. I mean, if you look at on the tech level, if you look at the amount of data they, mm. I don't want to use the word spam, but they send a lot of data mm. uh, for an OMS system or for a very large scale, you know, trading house. Um, mm. Like, if we if we can convert, you know, what are all the floor traders? Those big banks they trade what derivatives and bonds mm. and et cetera between each other. They have that in some sort of fireblocks custody. I mean, you take T plus four down to T mm. plus 20 minutes, mm. you know, that, that level of tech alone and security tokens could completely change mm. the way uh, institutional trading is done. Uh, and that's, that's their, that's their target. That's their game. I think that's interesting because, because this is one of the big things I think that will make people, well, people in traditional finance go to crypto is this move from like, say quarterly earnings, to real-time reporting i mean yeah. that's just going to be such a game changer yeah you, know, you, you press a button and you get funded within five minutes you know mm. the um yeah something i talked i was at an institutional guy uc its conference um last year and they were talking mm. about trade mm. and doing um those weekly and monthly mm. um income settlements so mm. you know money market stuff uh, throwing a bunch of capital in there. They usually can't mm. trade it or invest mm. it elsewhere, but they could park it in, in a liquidity mm. pool. Being able to just to do those calculations and reporting mm. faster than they can now is a, a massive, massive advantage mm. for them. So mm. no, you're right. Having those, that, that real time exposure mm. and mm. real time trackability instead mm. of sending off a report to one bank and then it comes back and then it has to be checked. It has to be ordered. Mm. Oh, they're out by like a half percent. Oh, it's mm. an error. It's fine. Mm. Don't worry about it. Having it as a, you know, zero knowledge zero trust mm. it's just there in raw data is a is, is a huge advantage so no the trade by guys are, are massively interested in it the treasury guys are massively interested in it it's basically just the the routes in and out mm. and they're worried about what do you mean by that what do you mean by that so how to get their you know their their pound sterling into a stable coin how to get it onto a platform and infrastructure that can't be hacked and how they can interrupt with it in real time it's oh, is that, that a big a concern is that still a big concern with companies yeah it's it's it just comes down to the unknown you know where are these assets hmm. actually parked you know where can we see them how can we trust you know there's a lot of this how not usually a why they know why they want to do it because there's an advantage and there's a way to make a bit of yield hmm. Um, it's usually the 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 how is it done and where is it done, not even but, how much we're going to pay for it. But but for for Pat, for example, with stable coins, for you for US dollars, I think USDC is kind of becoming the standard. But for the pound, yes. there is kind of no winner yet, is there? No, there's a few out there. Um, none of them of that same kind of size. Let's face it, the mm. UK is an island; it's a lot smaller. Mm. Um, small liquidity. Uh, so. And I, one thing I didn't know, and this, I'm not a finance guy, I'm a mm. I'm a tech guy, um, mm. is yeah, a lot of a lot of trading in the UK is done in in US dollars. So they they either have an account somewhere um, or an entity somewhere, and mm. they trade most of their liquidity in in US dollar value, not not pounds. Um, everything FX, they're just doing FX forwards and uh, and covers and etc. to kind of take care of any any you know, any kind of risk. Oh, but they are okay, looking at okay. they're looking at they look at USDC. USDT is not even an option. Uh, we mm. support both just to be market agnostic, mm. but yeah, we see far more interest on the USDC side than than USDT definitely. Oh, so so GBP is just on an off ramp to the UK. Basically. So they'll, they'll offer an on ramp, and they'll want to do something yeah, with okay. it, yeah. and they're doing something with it. They already kind of know what they want to do with it. They want to park it somewhere. They want to get yeah. yield. There's a, a specific contract yeah. they want to deal with, but it comes down to the how. How is it secured, and how do we know that this twenty yeah. million US dollars yeah. that we're parking for sixty days is yeah. not going to go fly by? So, so do you, like UK pension funds? Do they store their money in dollars or pounds? In it depends on the fund. Uh, they're all 
it's, okay. you take, take take your pick. I mean, some of them are, are UK sovereign only, so they'll only do pounds. They'll only do UK equities or UK whatever. The the only ones we've really had any, I suppose, outreach to or um, or communications with are kind of more your London based, I suppose, asset manager, trade fi. Um, uh, what was one? They do insurance on container ships or well, something like that. Um, they sit on a large amount of capital for. 80 to 90 days at a time and they can't do anything with it apart from treasury they can't trade it can't invest it yeah. but they can stake it so staking that capital against a stable yeah. coin or in an amm or something like that is is desirable and that's where i think they they want more of a um up-to-date day-by-day kind of reconciliation rather than month by month yeah i was just trying to figure out if there's a market for a gbp stable coin to i think um... there could be eventually it's just uh, size wise i mean even a lot of uk retail is still trading in usdt usdc okay fair enough ever everyone talks in dollars unfortunately it's some, mm. some of that marketing we were gbp only for the first three years now we just agnostic oh everyone, okay fair uh, enough. <laughs> everyone values in dollars. Our, our default for our platform is still gbp obviously because we're a uk mm. company we're mm. with the fca mm. all that good stuff mm. but it's still just everyone talks in dollars for some okay reason. it's just it's just a crypto thing i think mm. Uh, you talk about equities and everything else, they're all GBP. Uh, it depends on the crowd you're talking to, maybe. So maybe there's a mm. uh, a good argument there for um, uh, retail talks. It's USDA quite funny. It's only yeah. and the others talk about, which th- it depends who you're talking to for GBP. It's quite funny how after all of this crypto stuff and people worried of that dollars will become worthless, how it's actually strengthened the dollar, probably. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have, we saw the, the, the dollar euro flipping it yeah. and i was like and now a friend of mine's like oh, i can't wait for us dollars and pounds to be paid one to one i said mate that would be like armageddon if that happens <laughs> yeah. like, you know. all right okay we might, we might, we might consider reinvading if that happens mm-hmm. <laughs> okay anyway i know we're on the clock so um yeah it's been really good to talk to you today and uh, yeah, hopefully sure. uh, we can have you on another time as well so yeah it'd be yeah. good i mean let's catch up in kind of six months and see what happens yeah. you know, after the eth merge let's see if we come out of this bear market unscathed mm. and see if the winter turns into spring mm. um and yeah we start seeing a bit of a cleanup of the industry and a bit of a cleanup of the um of the crypto image uh um, yeah. you know yeah. bitcoin and crypto not the same thing crypto and blockchain is not the same thing but we're you know we're a big tribe we're still all in the, all in this together so you know i'm what people what call forever bullish but um <laughs> i think i think you have to have a positive mindset yeah, you have this. to yeah you uh, go mad you'll go mad if you if you don't you have go a, mad a positive if, outlook in this what's the um what's the term i'll leave you with when in doubt zoom out yeah good, yeah that's a good uh, saying to uh, finish off with thanks a lot <laughs> thank you very many guys have a good day talk to you soon thanks. talk soon thanks bye <laughs>